Praise God. Powerful worship, powerful reminder of our freedom in Christ. And today we get to celebrate what I call double freedom. Freedom in Jesus and freedom in this nation. We're celebrating the independence this weekend and the brave men and women who fought to obtain and preserve our freedom. And this preservation has allowed us to practice our faith in peace, as you can see from the video we watched. We also have the freedom to love our neighbor with the love of Jesus Christ. We also take this opportunity this weekend to remember the great sacrifice, and we do this every Sunday we come together, to remember the great sacrifice of our Savior Jesus, who lived, died, and defeated death so that we could be set free. Amen. My heart for this message today is that we be good stewards of our freedom because our freedom was a costly gift. Freedom isn't free. We are aware of that, right? Freedom isn't free. It's important that we steward what has been sacrificially given to us. And when I think of our freedoms, I can't just think of our constitution. I have to also think of Jesus. And I want to push something forward here today that I think is extremely important. Freedom comes with responsibility. Freedom comes with responsibility. And I want to open up to Titus 2, 11 through 14. I'm going to read two other supporting scriptures to, to drive home this point. And I want to talk about the spiritual freedom we have and how it comes with responsibility and also the physical freedom we have and how that also comes with responsibility. Titus 2, this is Paul writing to Titus, and he reminds him of the gospel of Jesus Christ and being set free. And it took the life of Christ to do that. And this is what it says in verse 11, Titus 2, verse 11 through 14. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. Who, who is the grace of God that's been revealed? Jesus. He's talking about Jesus bringing salvation to all people, salvation from sin and death. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. While we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. He's referring to the return of Christ, which I preached last week. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people totally committed to doing good deeds. Amen. Free from sin. I want to go now to Romans chapter 6. And Paul tells a beautiful uh, beautiful explanation of the gospel and what Jesus has done for us in, in Romans 5. And he talks about being set free from sin and, and being free to worship God uh, with your life in the entire book of Romans. But he ends with uh, chapter 5 and to verse, or in chapter 6, verse 1, when he says this, because of all that God, God's done for you, and because you've been set free from sin by the grace of Jesus Christ, by the cross, he says this in verse 1, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? And he says, of course not. Of course not. And here is his answer to that in verse 12. So Romans 6, verse 12, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. He's talking about spiritual death. But now you have new life. So use your whole body, your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom 
of God's grace. Wow. So we've been set free by what Jesus has done. He's saying, do not give in to what used to enslave you. Stay free. Stay free from sin. In Galatians 5, Paul talks to the church, and the church was being influenced to go, go back to their law ways of following a bunch of these rules. And one of them was the Jews were trying to push on the Gentiles that they should be circumcised just like they were to be saw fit as people of God. And that was not the requirement for salvation at all. It was faith in Jesus Christ, and that makes you saved. And so Paul is warning them not to do that. And he says this in uh, verse 13 of Galatians 5. For you have been called to live in freedom. Wow, think about that. You've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law, and he's talking about the Ten Commandments, the law of Moses, can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. I think that's an interesting verse right now, isn't it? Let me read that one more time. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, this is verse 15. I know this might not be on the screen for you. Watch out, beware of destroying one another. So when I read these three scriptures to you, what I see here is, is that we have freedom from sin because of the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that freedom from sin comes with responsibility to not return and indulge and gratify that sin. And just to help you be a little relieved here, the power of the Holy Spirit lives in you to help you not give in to that old life. And I want to encourage you right now, if you feel, excuse me, if you feel enslaved to sin, if you feel that you are having a hard time getting away from it. I want to encourage you to cry out to Jesus for help. It's one of the simplest things I've ever done in my life is just cry out to Jesus. Jesus, help me overcome this. Help me not give in to this. And as well as we need to be responsible to not dwell in those environments or things that can cause us to sin. Because we've been set free, so why go back and return to those things? Amen? So we have this freedom. And he goes on, and and I want to make sure we understand, too, that the cost of this freedom was the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And we sang that today, didn't we? The precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so to continue in habitual sin, to continue in, in, in things that are not of God according to his word, I would implore to you is truly to to not appreciate the cost of Jesus' life on the cross. And one of the ways we can appreciate our freedom is to see the cost of Jesus' life on the cross and what it took for us to be set free and to turn away from those things. God is calling us to, to give our lives to serve him and not our sinful desires. And here's the thing that's interesting. To serve our sin is actually not to live free, is it? Because then we become a slave again to that sin. And here's what's interesting too. We may live in a free country, but be controlled by sin. Isn't that scary? And to be controlled by sin is actually not to be free. And Jesus came to set the captives free, he said, to set us free. That's why he came, to set the oppressed free. We've been set free. He goes on in these verses to say, we've been set free to love one another. Amen for that. Galatians 5 says, there is no law against the fruit of the spirit. There is no law that should stop you. In other words, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, 
Paul says it, and I'll read it to you actually. He says here in verse 23, I'm going to read verse 22 and 23 in Galatians 5. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. In other words, God says, do those freely as much as you want. You're free to love as much as you want. You're free to, to be peaceful and patient and kindness and good and faithful. There is no limit to what you're allowed to do with that. Isn't that awesome? So right now in our world that is very uh, hostile, it seems, right? Volatile, tense. There is no law against you loving people. Praise God for that. It could use some love right now, couldn't it? Thirdly, we have the freedom to share the truth and the message of Jesus. We have the freedom to speak the name of Jesus in this country. Let his name roll off our tongues, please. Let his name come off our tongue. Let, let, let his name come off in our conversations and, and, and let our neighbors and our friends and our community know that there is freedom in Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to ask a question and then I need to share with you something that God has pushed on my heart. And I don't want to necessarily just get away from the spiritual freedom of, of being set free from sin and death. I'm not trying to just turn away from that and just focus on our physical freedom. I think these correlate actually a lot. You're going to find out here in a second. I think that, that we can become so caught up in the things of this world and the sinful things of this world that we actually don't live out the freedom we have in our country because we're distracted and preoccupied by those things. So I want to turn this now to this question. Are we taking advantage or taking for granted our freedom? Are we taking advantage of the freedom we have or are we taking it for granted? And this next part uh, makes me want to have my car running, just so you know. Any emails you can send to uh, my email, it's dwood at calvarydover.org. That would be Dorothy Wood. Uh, at, no, I was just joking. If she's watching right now, she's going to start cracking up. I know it. I've told you before, God will give me things to say to the church. And I have to be honest with you. Um, Today is definitely one of those days, and today is not just for our church, but for the American church. And I don't know if this will go viral or not. I don't care. It's just, this is what God needs me to say to the American church, okay? I was out reading my Bible or trying to, and I couldn't. I was out praying about our nation. This is over a month ago. And I'm out by this cornfield that I found that I can kind of get alone with God and talk. And I was in my car and I was trying to get into my word and, and, and I couldn't. I had to pull out my, my writing pad and I had to write down what God gave me. And as I was praying and meditating on our nation and what we're going through, this is what God gave me. He said, we don't lack freedom here. We lack obedience. The American church is squandering wasting freedoms that could be used to save this nation. And man, that hit me in the gut. And then he, I, I kept going, and this came to my mind, freedom means choice, but it doesn't mean obedience. See, there's the blessing and the curse of the free will, isn't there? Free will says you can choose what you want to do. There's a blessing and there's a curse to that, isn't there? Because you can choose to do what's right or you can choose to do what's wrong. You can choose to obey. You can choose to use your freedom for good or you can choose to use your freedom for bad. The defining factor for the church is that we use our freedom for good. And not just any kind of good because the word good is under attack, isn't it? Tell me, how, you do, you, how do you define good in our nation? Think about that. What one person thinks is good and another person thinks is good is not what the other camp thinks is good. How do you define what is good? Well, you use the Bible to define what is good. Christians have to use the word of God to define what is true, what is right, 
and what is good. Freedom means choice, but it doesn't mean obedience. Just because I am free doesn't mean I obey what God says. Just because I'm free from sin and free to express my faith doesn't mean I use those gifts to actually live free. And in fact, even myself, I've taken for granted the freedom and I've at times not done things I should do that freedom allows me to do. And obeying God is stewarding the freedom he has given us spiritually. And in this country, we have freedom as well. But here's the thing. We can be free and not live free. And the church needs to wake up. The church needs to wake up in our nation. Because one of the things I feel that I'm concerned about is we've used our freedom for our own plans and not God's. And that hurts to hear too. And that hurt for me to feel that and to see that in scripture. It's been something I've been saying for a long time is that we have freedoms. We have the time. We have this amazing nation and and we're not using it for the glory of God. And there was more that God gave me. And I'm not going to go into the detail of the spiritual warfare that's taking place. But this is in a nutshell what God gave me that day. The devil has exploited our freedom by getting us distracted with this world. If the devil can keep us believers and Christians quiet, if the devil can keep us living and gratifying our sin and getting distracted with the pleasures of this world, we are ineffective and then he moves in his evil ones in place to start wreaking havoc in our world. Not just our nation, our world. So when we are not actively being the church, Just so you guys know, the devil doesn't stop working. He doesn't take vacations. Neither does God. Praise God for that, right? He never never sleeps or slumber. But the devil doesn't stop either. He is constantly, constantly working against us. And if he can get the church to argue with each other, if he can get the church to be like focusing on the wrong priorities in life and focusing on building something here on earth and, and, and there's nothing wrong with enjoying life, but if it becomes higher than God's mission on earth, then there's a problem. And if, if Satan can get us to that place, then he's happy, just so you know. And I actually think that the church needs to take an honest look at itself. We need to look in the mirror. And that's all I kept feeling that day is, is God was like, look in the mirror, Ryan. Church of America, look in the mirror because we've had freedom to worship. This is where it starts to get a little harder, okay? Just, just brace yourself, buckle in. We've had freedom of religion. We've had freedom of speech, but it doesn't seem to have helped save our nation. In fact, Christianity is in a decline. Church attendance before COVID was in a decline. Churches were closing at a rapid rate. Atheism and what's called nuns or agnostics was, is going to be doubling here in the years to come. In other words, our nation has become less godly and has become more godless. And God's like, you've had your freedom. You don't lack freedom. You lack obedience. Do you understand now where he's coming from? Because here's what's scary to me is, is we have the freedoms. We should be the most powerful church in the world. And I mean spiritual power, not like weapons and rockets and stuff like that. We should be the most effective church in our world. Countries with little to no freedom are having large Christian movements. The church in Pakistan is the fastest growing church in the nation. And if they are caught, if women are caught worshiping God and doing things for Christ, they will be beheaded. It's a will be They will be flogged. They will be stoned. They will be banished from their family. There is a revival taking place in Pakistan, and you're not even allowed to worship God there. At least our God, Jesus. Wow. China is the same thing. And here's a strong statement that we need to understand. These churches in other countries learn that they don't need a government to tell them they can worship God. 
They do it and they take the suffering that comes with it. They don't need permission from a government to worship God and neither do we, right? We can worship God however we want because God gave us permission to do it. And God is saying, even if you must suffer, you must worship me. In other words, true devotion will be seen here soon in the coming years. Maybe my kids will have to really say, I worship God no matter what and be beaten or whatever. That may be the reality for my children here in America. I'm going to say another strong statement. We can't blame the government for a lack of Christianity. God didn't command the United States government to make disciples. God commanded the church to make disciples. It's not the government's calling to be ambassadors for the kingdom of God. That's the role of the church. And if you want to clap, you can. That's okay. Because that is true. Man, this is heavy stuff, isn't it? But sometimes we just need a gut check to remember our priorities and what is first and last. And that's my next, my next point here. The kingdom of God is first. As Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, we are citizens of heaven first. When you become a follower of Christ, you become a citizen of God. And so you function the way God wants you to function. That's why we have permission to worship God. If our land decides to close down churches and not let us sing, you saw that, you saw that right, in California? If our land decides to say that you can't, guess what we're going to do? We're still going to. We're still going to. We're still going to worship God because it's God that gives us the permission to. We read that in Acts 4 where Peter and, and John healed a man and they told him to stop preaching the gospel. And they said, I can't obey man. I must obey God. We're going to continue to worship God, but we will probably suffer for it. And maybe that will wake up the church. And one of the questions, I even put it on Facebook today because I, I couldn't keep it in any longer. I've been thinking about it for a while. The question was if... If we can't obey God when things are good, how are we going to obey God when things get bad? If we can't obey God right now and use the freedoms we have to steward them well and to do good with them, how are we going to, how are we going to obey God when things get bad? And I do hope that when, if things get worse, this is what I hope. I hope that it actually inspires the church to wake up, you know? Like, I'm praying that's actually what happens is it goes, okay, enough is enough. We're going to do what God's asked us to do no matter what anyone says in this country. But I believe we need to keep the kingdom of God first. And I'm not saying that we don't have reasons to be concerned about our liberties as Americans. I actually think we do. We need to be concerned about the liberties that are being under attack in America because they are. Whether we want to believe it or not, they are. The, the values of God's word are under attack in our nation. So I'm not dismissing that reality, it's true. But I do think that we need to keep things in proper perspective. And so the kingdom of God comes first and then, and then we're American citizens. We have this great privilege to be American citizens in this country. But let me give you an example. This is a question that hit me this week. What good is a country with physically free people but spiritually enslaved by sin and going to hell. What good is a country with physically free people, but spiritually enslaved by sin and going to hell? That's a concern for me as a pastor, as a Christian, and as a friend who has neighbors and friends who may be free to worship in this land, but they don't worship God, they worship sin. That's concerning. Anyone else concerned about that? This is what breaks the heart of God. This is what breaks the heart of God. And in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of, the kingdom of God, the people who is us, there's another way to do these things. I've been calling this the third way. I found out my brother's doing the same thing. It's the way of the kingdom of God and how we can live on this earth the way God would want us to live, okay? Let me give you an example of that. Uh, can you show this picture? I want you to see this picture. It's been circling around. Oh, you got to pull out the other thing. I 
don't know if you can fix that or not, but, but I'll read it to you. What you see here is in the chop zone in Seattle, this is a Luciferian, a worshiper of Satan that gave his life to Jesus and was water baptized. Praise God. What I see here is, is someone ignoring the arguments on media, ignoring the arguments of sides and going the way of the kingdom. What happened was a group of men, one's the evangelist and his buddies, they went to Seattle and saw hurting there. They, they felt God say, go to Seattle and start to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus. So they went there on the front line to share their faith, and they end up finding that people are receptive to receive Jesus in the middle of this chaos. So instead of necessarily picking a side, what they decided to do is pick the side of Jesus and go share the gospel because time is short. And these same guys also delivered a man from a demon, and I watched a video and it looks legit. There's also many people in Minneapolis right now having revival, being water baptized on the same corner that George Floyd was, was killed there and died. Same corner. There's a, there is a revival taking place because the church said, we're going to rise up and do something about this because we have the freedom to do so. See, now is the time, church. You get what I'm saying today? You get what God's trying to say, really? Now is the time. Now is the time to love our neighbor as ourself. Wow. I love um, being in this country. When you talk to people, they say, there's no other country I'd want to live in. I think laws are great. Laws keep us safe. They help define boundaries and, and what is right and wrong. They help us to serve uh, justice. And, and I wouldn't want to live in a land with no laws, Right? But here's the thing, laws cannot fix the wicked hearts of mankind. Laws help you know what's right and wrong, but they do not fix the heart of man. We as believers cannot put our hope in the laws of the land because they keep changing, don't they? The only thing we can put our hope in is the gospel of Jesus Christ to change people before Jesus comes back. It will be bad before Jesus returns. So we already know that biblically. We try to fix our land with laws. This is what our land does. This is what our, our, our government does. They try to fix our land with laws instead of Jesus. The church needs to show the government how it's done. And our platform is through our churches, our homes, and our love. Amen. There's a reason why Calvary has a food pantry in Delaware. There's a reason why we have small groups and community groups in our homes. And there's a reason why on 4th of July, Margaret's team was helping serve another church in Milford to feed veterans in our state on 4th of July. Touche to Margaret and the team. Touche to our food pantry. Praise God for them. Hope on 4th of July for our veterans. There's a reason why we go and hand out waters to those who are arguing with each other. There's a reason why we go to Seattle. In the midst of this chaos of what to do, there are hurting people going to hell, and the church sees that because the church has kingdom vision, not just American vision. Understand? And again, I'm saying all this in love. You know that, right? And I'm saying all this understanding that I appreciate the land we live in a lot. So how can we steward our freedom better? Because I've, I've pretty much, the, the gut check I got from God, I just gave to you now. Now we're carrying the burden together. Isn't that fun? But now we have to do something, right? Because God doesn't tell you all that stuff and then, just, and then you just do nothing with it. That's not using your freedom properly. I'm going to live free and brave, church. 
no matter what takes place in this country. I'm not going to waste the death and the resurrection of Jesus, and I'm not going to waste the death of good men and women who died for us to live in America, to live free in America. We cannot waste those sacrifices. Freedom from sin and freedom in this country took sacrifice that deserves my respect, our respect, our responsibility, and our gratitude. Just so you know, I'm not running for president. This is not a president speech. I owe it to God and to those who died. I owe it to God and to those who died to steward my freedom well. It's not going to be easy. It's never easy to use our freedom to reach our nation for Christ. It will not be easy, church. It is not an easy fix. I don't have an easy fix for you today on how you should steward your freedom well. All I know is, is we first need to appreciate what we have, right? And we need to to be responsible with what we have. And we need to respect what we have, what Jesus has done for us, what we have in this nation. It won't be easy because it's gonna take a denial of self to serve others. It's gonna take you focusing on God's plans instead of our own all the time. There's nothing wrong with what God's given us. We have to work. We, we, we can plan vacations. I'm going on vacation soon. I could definitely use the rest right now. We're gonna do that. There's nothing wrong with those things, but ultimately God's perspective for us, like what is, here's the thing that hit me this week. What does God think about everything going on right now? What does God see? And that's what we want to figure out. And then what does God want us to do in this climate of our world right now and in our nation? Here's some things to think about. We have freedom of speech, so let us speak the hope and message of Jesus Christ. We have the freedom to worship, so let us put down our idols and love God. We have the freedom to love, so let us find ways to show that love, even if it isn't received, we have the freedom to love. You know that you can disagree with someone without hating them? Did you know that? Did you know that you can have your opinions, but let's keep God's word the final word? It should be filtered through God's word. I think we need to be careful about getting pulled into the divisiveness that hinders our witness. Let me say that again. We need to be careful about getting pulled into the divisiveness that hinders our witness. In other words, when people see or hear our very passionate thoughts, it could be hindering what bridge we have to, call, to talk to them about the gospel. And the devil wants to divide us. The devil wants us to have this division because if he has that, then people won't talk to you about Jesus. So in other words, we, if we're not careful, we could be burning bridges. We can focus on obeying what God called us to do. And it says, he said to make disciples. To make a disciple means to help someone believe and follow Jesus. It's simple as that. That's what it is to make a disciple. But it's not easy because you have to walk with them and you have to teach them things. You have to show them things. And so it takes time and it takes love and it takes relationship. But ultimately, I want to put, out the, I want to put this out to you. These are just ideas of what you have right now that you can do. But I wanna, I wanna end with this. I can't really tell you what to do because I don't wanna limit the freedom that you have to do whatever God wants you to do. Like I can give you ideas and I can give even my family ideas of what to do. We see in the Bible how you can love others, but you're gonna love in ways I don't love because you have neighbors that need certain kind of love, right? So what I'm asking us to do as a church is go, what is God asking us to do? In your context, in your home, in your neighborhood, what is God asking you to do? Because you will probably have some things and ideas that I would even think of. Like I could, li I could take 30 minutes right now, and I'm not going to because it's time to go here soon, but I could take 30 minutes right now to give you a bunch of ideas, but I think the best ones are the ones that God gives you to do in your context. And God will give you a way 
to use your freedom in America and your freedom in Christ to do good and to serve your fellow man. And praise God for a church that knows how to do that. What an amazing church we have here. I want to leave you with this quote from Robbie Zacharias. He posted it yesterday. Well, Robbie Zacharias actually passed away. So his family, his organization posted this quote on July 4th. True freedom is not the liberty to do whatever we want. It is the strength to do what we should. That is also true bravery. May God grant us that strength. True freedom is not the liberty to do whatever we want. It is the strength to do what we should. That is also true bravery. May God grant us that strength. That's a great prayer. May God grant us the strength to do what we need to do. So church, don't hear me wrong today. I'm not anti-American, right? You didn't, you didn't catch that, did you? I am all for what this country is trying to accomplish. But God comes first in my life. And what God wants us to do no amount of freedom or lack of freedom is gonna change that. Because we can either be the church in Pakistan and China or the church in America and we're supposed to worship God. And we're supposed to love our our neighbor as ourself, amen? Do not let the stuff that's going on in our land distract you from the most important mission on earth to seek and to save the lost, to go make disciples. And together we're gonna do that. And I will say, there are things that we needed to preserve still in our country. So I'm not saying that we do not defend the freedom we have in our country. All I'm saying is let's just make sure God comes first and then God will help us do all the other things in our lives. Amen? Let me stand together and pray. God, we take your word and your prophetic message for us today with humble hearts. God, I've already searched my heart and I'll continue to search my heart to know what I need to do to appreciate what Jesus has done for me. Thank you, God, for the reminder today that I should not indulge in my sin because I'm free from it. I should actually not return to it and live a holy life. And God, I thank you for this great nation that we live in that allows us to worship in peace today. And Lord, we wanna use our freedom well and steward it well for your mission here on earth to seek and to save the lost. So God, we commit ourselves to you again. We recommit ourselves if we have to today. And say, God, we follow you first and foremost above all. And we use our freedom spiritually and physically in this nation to help people people be set free for eternity, not just here on earth. Burn that into our hearts today. God, I pray that today would be that the burden you gave me that day in the car, I pray that same burden would be on us, that we have to do something for your kingdom. And God, show us what that is individually for each of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. God bless you, church. God bless you. Have a great day.